I'm Funky Monkey. Welcome to my house of love. Ah, the virtual pop star. While my own knowledge of, and tolerance for, the Vocaloids is extremely limited, I do understand the desire for a perfect pop icon. One that will never age, never be caught doing anything illicit, never go off the rails, buy a monkey and terrorise their bodyguards. Our subjects for this episode, however, are anything but perfect. Seemingly, they're the antithesis of the squeaky clean pop star image. I am, of course, referring to the animated project known as Gorillaz. Created in 1998 by Damon Albarn and Jamie Hewlett, Gorillaz released their self-titled debut album three years later. The story is a depressingly familiar one in modern Britain, a delinquent at the wrong end of his twenties runs down a simple keyboard shop assistant, then takes him on joyrides until his brain restarts. The tale takes a turn for the weird when they meet an expat from the slums of New York and are sent a Japanese guitarist in the post. Thus, the virtual band is born. The self-titled debut album Gorillaz first hit our shores in 2001, introducing us to the world of Kong Studios and its denizens in grand style, as they fight off a troop of zombie gorillas with the help of Dell, ghostly rapper and then resident of drummer Russell Hobbs, in their breakthrough music video Clint Eastwood. At the time, the band weren't really much more than the loose affiliation of disparate individuals, gleefully thrown together by avaricious satanic bassist Murdoch Nichols. In reality, the musical side of Gorillaz was chiefly the work of increasingly introspective and would-be former frontman of Blur, Damon Albarn, alongside a slew of collaborators. The original idea behind this virtual band was to take a satirical swipe at the madness of late 90s MTV, and so to combat the fakeness of bubblegum. Pop, Gorillas were born. The most dramatic thing to happen during the first phase was that Murdoch's Winnebago was stolen and eventually recovered. Murdoch suspected his arch rival Dr. Wurzel, but little, if anything, was ever proven. Back in the real world, the public became increasingly aware of these simian songsters thanks to remixes of Clint Eastwood by Garage Wunderkind Ed Case and the famous Soul Child remix of 192000 by producer Damien Mendis. Mendis tells of how he was given all of the demos and finished songs from the album, and given the choice of any song to remix. Of course, he didn't feel that any song really had any potential to be remixed. After voicing his concerns, he was later contacted and informed of work commencing on a video for 192000. And so the new mix was created, and the video slightly reworked to accompany it. In the real world, the word movie was mentioned, rumours began to circulate, and the boys began to meet with studio execs. And immediately wished they hadn't. As I understand it, it's the classic tale that the studio execs wanted to own and control the project. And the boys, Jamie and Damon, really didn't want to give up that much control of gorillas to them. In the gorillas' own world, this hiatus was explained as too much, too soon, and an excess of the rock star lifestyle overcame the band. Thus, they went their separate ways, never to be heard from again. At least, that was what they thought. But before we get to that, let's dive into the album. Gorillas. And it's a trippy affair, flowing from a mid-tempo opener into a synth-punk crowd-pleaser, in 5-4 time no less, before finally settling into the melancholy that will characterise the rest of this album. Yes, this is a very dark listen for the most part, hip-hop beats and minor chords creating an air of hopelessness, with only the occasional burst of punkish energy to propel it forward. Despite this, the singles are catchy, and the mood is at least consistent. I would rate this album a solid 7 out of 10. Mostly miserable, but undeniably classic. Oh, 
While far flung and far from friendly, fate finagled further fun and frolics for our funky foursome, while in the real world, viral viciousness eviscerated the evils of erroneous esteem. As the viral campaign Reject False Icons got underway. This is where things got interesting for the band, as during the hiatus, Noodle learns her origin and discovers that she could speak English all along. Russell is finally divested of his ghostly accomplice Dell. Murdoch went to Mexico, was jailed, escaped, and then returned. Only 2D returned to a relatively normal life, earning a crust as a fairground ride assistant. Interestingly, Cannon states that this album was written by Noodle, a claim which is borne out by the song Dare. Thus, Demon Days came to be. In reality, this album was written again by Albarn, who was inspired by several incidents in his daily life, most notably a trip through China, where he saw many provincial towns that were almost desolate, and mile after mile of unspoilt forest. Albarn and Hewlett were excited to prove that the Gorillaz project was more than just a one-off gimmick band, and work on the second album Demon Days progressed smoothly, leading the album to be released in May of 2005. This time, the band were planning to tour the album. Sadly, this didn't pan out. Although the album was performed live by Albarn, and, surprisingly, almost all of the album's collaborators. The resulting live show was released on DVD, and actually reached number one in the UK charts. Things were really looking up for the Gorillas, All up until that unfortunate business of the El Manana incident. But that's another story for another time. Let us instead dive into the second album, Demon Days. This album is more uneven than Gorillaz, switching between moods several times. From post-apocalyptic, to morose, to funky, to downbeat via wistful, to the poppy interlude of Dare, to the three-track album finish, telling the tale of the monkey's head mountain, and actually ending on a hopeful note with the major chorded title track. As such, it's a more interesting listen. The singles are mostly taken from the middle section of the album, and range between the catchily simple Dirty Harry and the terribly sad El Manana. But even as the mood shifts several times, one can see themes appear in Demon Days, excepting of course the pure pop Dare, which seems to come from out of nowhere. In summarising this album, I see the spiritual journey from Kong Studios to the monkey's head via the excess of Hollywood, and the wistful longings of love's past. Not for nothing is the second album considered difficult, and yet Alban et al. carry off this sophomore effort with confidence, honesty, and a hint of optimism. A soaring 9 out of 10 from me. So then, gentle viewer, that was a whistle-stop tour of Gorillaz Phase 1 and 2. And you know something? If nothing else, I'm definitely going to put the idea, at least, into the House of Love. My verdict? I think it was a genius idea to create a virtual pop band to rediscover your sound, and then leave all of the public attention to them. And while they won the first virtual band, cartoon characters having made music since at least the original Chipmunks, they are one of the best, and certainly the first to be so humanly fleshed out. And while I don't think the beat of the Gorillas is the rhythm of life, there's certainly enough in their singles for anyone to have a favourite. Why not tell me yours in the comments? I've been Funky Monkey, and you've just had your recommended dosage of animated pop music madness. So long, folks! <laughs>